Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we review our favorite RPGs, collectible card games, MMOs, video games, PC games, and bring up interesting topics and things that we'd like to share with everyone. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the 5th Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Writers are bad people, you guys. <laughs> no, 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 we're just creative. Speaking of which, does anyone want a lollipop? How am I supposed to talk around the lollipop? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. They can have lollipops. It's, it's a trick to keep everyone in the audience quiet. <laughs> That's a good plan. I want to encourage speaking. I remember one of the panels I went to with the writers, and they said the only difference between uh, my, my um, browser history and the serial killers there's probably enough random other stuff that the CIA has figured out. I think it's a writer. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I'm just like, I mean, Google must be judging me constantly because what was the thing that I, oh, God. I am, um, uh, so I'm, I'm writing the second one of these comic books, which is an adaptation of this woman, Bonnie Jo Campbell's work, and her work is very dark. It's called Rural Noir. And, and it's all these people who live sort of outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan, and they're all like, drug addicts or being like violently physically abused. So the first story in the book is this very short story where there's a 13 year old girl and her parents and they're on the porch of their house and they open the door. It's like a summer cottage. Uh, and these people have broken in and they've been using it to cook meth and then they left. Um, and there was a girl that they had basically um, allowed to come in and they exchanged drugs for sex. And the girl is 16 and she's been there all week after the guys leave. Um, and she, as the 13 year old is walking in the front door, the 16 year old is sneaking out the back door. And it's sort of uh, the girl going through the house and like seeing what's happened in this week. And then the last thing she finds is a cum stained mattress on the back porch. And so I'm like Googling for reference images for like kitchen destroyed by meth dealers and cum stained mattress. And the worst part of it is I didn't get any relevant hits for cum stained mattress. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the At some point, you have to put the plus sign between the two words. You can Google find it correctly. <laughs> the, the exact line that the original author wrote is more jism than the mother has ever seen in her life. And then. <laughs> So if you Google that, maybe you would find it After I illustrated you know, the final panel of more jism than the mother has ever seen in her life, and I went to my husband and I was like, what do you think of this picture? <laughs> and I was like, it's supposed to be more jism than the woman has ever seen in his, her life. And she said, my husband said something to the effect of like, possibly I've seen more jism than the mother had in the story, but... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyone can write. Anyone can write. And Welcome to our panel. <laughs> what <Or> should they? <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, okay, so yes. Fun. Yes, uh, it is after 6 o'clock, so whether or not we like it, that is our segue into our panel. Anyone can write. Uh, <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Or draw, but anyway. Or draw, yes. Um, I am your moderator, KJ Kapsa. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm ready. I am so ready. Um, I write. Uh, I write short science fiction and fantasy. I've uh, sold short stories for about the past 15 years to so over uh, 40 different places, about 70 different stories. Um, my debut print collection is coming out in January. The Rams had algorithm and other stories. Here's my subtle marketing message as per request of my publisher. Shameless. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. 
Don't get it. It's not going to be quite that kind of metal. It's only 6 p.m. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can put that on the front. No, it won't, it won't stick. We tried that. Uh, <laughs> if you want, you can pre-order it now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Pinkybound if you want more information about it. Uh, come up afterwards, uh, grab a business card, a pen, or back issues of uh, these magazines in which you can read a sample of my work for free. Um, in addition to my professional work, uh, I have also some fan fiction floating around in the grain out there. Uh, I also have some work under a different name in the furry fandom. Um, and I've written and drawn the greeting cards. Uh, I've done eulogies, wedding toasts. I've written poetry for friends, journals for myself. So I've written all kinds of things and not just for me. <laughs> uh, my name is Monica Friedman. I've been writing speculative fiction for about 30 years, although I am less widely published than KJ is. But you can buy my novel, The Hermit, on Amazon. Um, and I have a few short short stories that are published. And uh, also you can buy this comic book if you want. It does not feature a name mattress in it. Unfortunately, <laughs> but it's got some next other, other choice <laughs> stuff in it that you might be interested in if you're interested in stuff like that. Um, and I, uh, I have an MFA in creative writing from uh, Western Michigan University, and um, and I've done some teaching of writing also. I'm Mir Um My fourth published short story is in this charity anthology. Um, Iron Doves, and all of the money goes to um, the Doves program, which protect, uh, helps protect people from domestic violence, stalking, uh, things like that, and about information about um, resources for people who are maybe um, in a bad situation on the back. Um, I made the mistake of getting a degree in creative writing from the U of A. Um, was the mistake the degree, or was the mistake the of A? Bull, I think. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I have also written many, many things for, for no money. Mm -hmm. um, the weirdest one was probably the epic poem about my friend's boobs for her birthday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, her boobs rescued a princess from, I think it was an over. I've also written in that genre. <laughs> well, you know, general kind of. <laughs> I like that really evasive answer. Erotic friend fan fiction. Oh, sure. 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 Yes. In, in, in poetry form, yes. Was there a lot of butt grabbing? Uh, there was. There was a lot of. It was. It was. It was steamy, but didn't you know? Didn't get anywhere till the end. I guess. Okay. Uh, I think I think that does it perhaps for an introduction. <laughs> or <laughs> ought to. <laughs> yeah, or, or ought to. Uh, so this is what this panel is. Uh, we all believe for various reasons and to various degrees that anyone can write, everyone should write, or some combination of the two. Uh, we're going to talk about why we believe that, all the fun ways you can start writing or get involved in writing, um, and why you should. Spoiler alert, it's fun. Um, so. We do invite questions and comments from you guys. The audience is small. Uh, I have a note down here saying, please raise your hand, but there's only three of you, so probably if you just start talking, it won't be much of an interruption, so you know, feel free. Uh, so I have some introductory questions here um, for the panelists. Why do you believe that anyone can write? All right, so I'm more on the side of everyone should write, and I believe that it's just a very healthy activity in which to engage. I think that journaling is, I mean, I think everyone should journal. I think like, the unexamined life is sort of the life that slips past you and you don't tend to recognize your mistakes or fix them if you're not thinking about them and journaling is a really good way to do that. Um, you know, I'm a person who's, who's lived a lot in my fantasy worlds and so bringing them out of myself and putting them into the world has helped put me into the world and make me a person who's like capable of sitting up here and, and having a conversation or whatever that is, you know, versus like the person who's always in the book or always in my head. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it feels good. It's really good for you just to express yourself however that is. And, and especially, you know, expressing yourself in, a, in journal form because like there's no judgment, right? Like probably no one will read it. If you're lucky, no one will read it. You hope no one reads it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only form of writing that you hope no one ever reads. It's your like, personal. I mean, I guess people write poetry and they're not 
read, but maybe some some people do. But yeah, I mean, I just I think it's a healthy activity. I think it's it's something that when you do it, you become a better person eventually. That's my thought. I I agree with Monica. Um, I mean, I think I, I think you need to have a way to express yourself, um, and whether or not someone else reads it, like. If you don't express yourself, you know, I don't want to say you go crazy, but maybe you go crazy. I mean, I would. That's that's in fact that's my favorite. Um, it's a line from Ray Bradbury. I think he says, "You must stay drunk on writing, so reality does not destroy you." Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite lines from a song was a "New York Minute," um, and it's about a guy who throws himself in front of a train. I think the line is, at some point, at some point he was too much in this world. And yeah, if I didn't write, if I didn't read, if I didn't do all this stuff, I would be too much in this world. So let's see. Um, I didn't give mine yet. Uh, we, we skipped right over the question of why you believe anyone can write, so I wasn't sure if we should go back to that yet. But um, so I have I have this whole other list of uh, of why I think people should write. I think both of you kind of like hit the essential, like an like an essential thing about journaling in particular. Um, although I think that there's like there's a lot more to it than that. It's not just journaling. Um, I think it can also be. I mean, maybe it goes without saying, but it can be a good creative outlet. Um, in addition for it to be like an emotional outlet to, for like a safe place for you to sort of like process and put your feelings and figure out who you are, um, this kind of this kind of sounds a little bit silly, but it keeps you occupied. It keeps you busy. I mean, you know, you know the old saying like idle hands are like the, the devil's playground or whatever. If you have a and and maybe maybe to put it in sort of dumber parlance, but like writing is my anti drug. Like if you, it, it gives you something to do that is healthy and constructive, um, especially if you have a hard time coping with reality or your life is difficult. You don't turn to other self destructive behaviors or other ways of spending your time that could be um, expensive, that could be harmful. Yeah. Um, You're looking at it's a really it's a really <laughs> <laughs> so in here, and I thought I would spread around the insight. That's not all. Quit destroying things. No, no, I'm just saying, like, you know, that's not the case for me, but okay. <laughs> I'm going to be self-destructive regardless. No, it's, it's, so, it's so much cheaper than any of my other hobbies. I'll say something else. Like, there was a book that I, that I, it's like a psychology book, but it's called Every Person's Life is Worth a Novel. And like I think every person's life is worth at least a story. Like, and and I think there are people who don't believe that about themselves. Uh, like I had this terrible writing job um, where, but part of it I did get to do some interviews of people, and they wanted it specifically people who worked in box offices at like music venues or something. And I happened to know a woman who worked in the box office at the Peoria Symphony Orchestra, and I was like, I'd like to interview you, and she said, Why? My job is so boring and stupid. And I interviewed her, and so she had some great anecdotes about like uh, people complaining that the trumpets were too shiny, and like um, uh, the, so the best, but the best one was uh, the violinist Joshua Bell came to the Peoria Symphony Orchestra. Wow. This Peoria, it's cold in the winter time. She had put her coat down on the table. Joshua Bell put his Stradivarius on top of her coat, so she was without a coat for two days because she couldn't touch this million-dollar violin. <laughs> yeah, so. Every person's life has many stories in it, I feel, and like that story would have been lost if I didn't write it down. Like she didn't think it was cool that Joshua Bell put his Stradivarius on her winter coat, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more for benefits of writing, I hadn't really given a lot of thought to like the, the non the nonfiction work since most of what I do professionally and even for fun is fiction. Um, but we haven't talked about some of these other things yet. Um, like the uh, like fan fiction and the role of fan fiction, like that's not something most people get compensated for, but that that helps you connect with other people, it helps you build community, it helps you give back to yeah. community or to fandom. Um, so like that's definitely huge. I think that that's certainly a benefit of writing. Um, I think we kind of already covered this. I mentioned gives you a break from reality. I mean, even if it's a if it's a cheap hobby, there are people unplugged from reality all kinds of ways. Um, 
you know, that's something you can do. That's funny, I mean, you say, because you're saying, like, it's, fan, it's like you're unplugging, but then you're using it to plug back in to yeah, other people. Yeah, different ways, I yeah. think. Um, so, yeah. Um, other other reasons why you should write. Other reasons why you should write. Um, I mean, as far as nonfiction goes, to let other people know that they're not alone in their experience, um, one of the best books I've ever read was, um, and I'm blanking on the name right now. Jenny Lawson's most recent book. Um, the first one was called Let's Pretend This Never Happened. I can't remember now. Anyways, it was about living with um, debilitating mental and physical illness. Oh, yeah. Um, and, but it was funny. And it was sort of like, you know, you could live with all of these problems and still still find the humor in life and the purpose. And it was just a very self-affirming thing to read. Uh, so there's that sort of like it, the, the communicating with other people, letting people know that they're not the only one. Yeah, and once it exists, it exists forever. Like you can be telling people that they're okay, you know, many years from now after your experience. And, um, Jack and I know this writer, Anna Red Sands. And she's like this really interesting life story, which is that she was born, she was the child of Dutch Reformed missionaries, and she was raised on the Navajo reservation. So she was this white girl, and she spoke Diné, and you know, she really wanted to be Navajo. And I think probably if she had been heterosexual, she probably would have married a Navajo man and stayed there. But she also realized, you know, like very surprisingly to herself that she was gay and there wasn't any place for her um, in either of those communities. And she's, she's about 65, 67 now. And she it took her 40 years, right, to find her place. And so she wrote this book, um, it's called To Drink From The Silver Cup. And I read it in many different iterations, like because some of it was more focused on the lesbian stuff, some was more on the religion, some was more on the Navajo. She finally figured it out, and she had this book, and she immediately began to shop it to publishers, and like right away someone picked it up. And I was like, you know, good for you, it's a great book. And then she had like an altercation with the managing editor, and she was like, you can't have my book, and furthermore, I don't think I'm ever going to publish this book. And I was like, what? Somebody's offering to publish your book and you said no. And she was like, I don't know, this and that. She, and she said to me, Monica, who do you think is going to read this book? And I had like a list, right? And I was like, oh my God, like all of these gender studies people and all these religious studies people. And you know, this and, and I went through and I said, I said, and beyond that, and I said, right now, there's a 12 year old lesbian girl sitting in her room wondering if there's a place for the world in the world for her. She needs your book. Like just publish it for that girl. Um, and she went through this whole other thing and eventually she found another publisher and she published the book and it's been very well received. But like, that was a story and she just thought, nobody cares about my story. And I was like, oh my God, like nobody else has that story. That is a unique story. Like you are the only white girl raised on an Indian reservation who speaks Diné and integrated the boarding school dorms and like all of that stuff. So you, you might think your story doesn't, isn't for other people, but other people do want to hear. Even even if you even if you think you can't write well or you actually can't write well, somebody will want to read your story. I mean, if it's I'm thinking here of like fan fiction that I've read um, or other work that I have read, um, where people just they write whatever they want, boop, it's up, and there's no there's no kind of gatekeeping. It's just anybody can post whatever, and I will read something and I will think this is terrible, who even likes this? But there will be like 2,000 favorites, 50 comments. So like, <laughs> it's all somebody, there is an audience out there somewhere for whatever it is that you make. So don't even, yeah, even if, even if you're not skilled, like somebody will like it. Somebody, somebody will think it's great. And um, something else to keep in mind is that even if, even if you do want to write professionally or someday you want to write professionally, everybody has to start somewhere and you can't expect magic right out of the gate. Um, which is not to say that if you, you know, if you want to improve, you shouldn't try, but definitely don't, I think, I think that there's this, there's this faulty assumption that you have to be a master at anything to enjoy doing it, and that's absolutely not true. In my experience, it actually goes the other way. You enjoy it more before you know what you're not <laughs> you doing it. Once, once you go to graduate school and you start analyzing it, then you're like, everything I do sucks and I hate doing this job. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I can't sit 
sing. I won't sing where other people can hear me, but I still do it. Oh, yeah, I play the ukulele very badly and loudly. <laughs> I like to listen to the ukulele. So many people see it. Like somebody will like like always like them. whatever it is that you make. Exactly. Um, so uh, I also have next on here ways to write and get involved in writing. If, if we have exhausted the topic of why should you write? Oh, how about this? Is there any is there any circumstance or reason under which you think you shouldn't write? Well, you know, it's funny. So when I was younger and I was writing and somebody would like do something that really pissed me off, I would just make them like a petty low level villain <laughs> in a story that I was writing. Um, and we definitely like I mean I would write these, you know, I mean not erotic friend fanfic, but we had we had this friend I would write stories about my friends and and certainly we did write stories in which we killed all of the people we hated. Um, and so this is like the 80s and the early 90s. And like now if you do that, you'll be suspended and they'll send you to a psychologist. So like I'm not saying don't do it, like don't bring it to, like don't show it to the people who might take offense at it. <laughs> like, 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 or you're aware of your audience. Maybe change people's names. Maybe change people's names, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Some other identifying characteristics. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that anyone should write, but I think that people, I think people can use anything for bad intent, I guess. Okay. Um, so yeah. if like you're writing your like 800 page, you know, Unabomber screed or whatever, like maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should go get help first, but um, I mean, those people don't recognize themselves. So they shouldn't be doing it, but like, what can I say to them? Hate you? writing. People who leave bad notes just to hurt somebody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 Yeah, because it can yeah. be really hurtful. Sure. Like the person who wrote all the notes and stuck them to my back in middle school. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not a fake thing. And it probably happens. wasn't even that creative, you know? No, it was yeah, poorly written. Exactly. Derivative. I got, yeah, I got them stuck into my locker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I've heard this insult before. <laughs> we were like in a Cyrano the Bergerac where they like do a lame insult of his nose and he's like, no, that's oh, not yeah. even good enough. And then he insults his nose for like 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So some people, yeah. Don't use writing for cruel purposes, I guess. Um, what if writing does not make you feel good or you're unhappy with what you produce? If the act of writing doesn't make you feel good, like, well, I mean, why does it not make you feel good? Does it not make you feel good because you're like, you know, 15 years old and you're in high school and they're making you write something terrible? Or is it because you're judging yourself? Um, I mean, if you don't like what you produce, you can always like throw it out or set it on fire and pretend you never wrote it. So I don't know if that's an excuse. So you would, you would argue for a try first, sort of like, self-reflect later? I think there are some people who are never, ever, 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 ever going to like it, like my stepson, for example. Like, I don't see him ever, you know, I don't see him ever writing anything for his own personal pleasure, even though it would probably be great for him, and he probably should do it, but I wouldn't force him to do it. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? Um, no, I think that's, that about covers it. Okay. I would um, I would I would uh, draw a distinction between writing that makes you feel bad because you're you're judging yourself or you're or you have I think it's Ira Glass that calls it the the taste gap or the skill gap of like I've you, read this yeah yeah so like as a so you're you're both a consumer and a creator and if you've been consuming something like writing for a very long time and you just start creating it your palate as a consumer is very refined so you know what you want to see. But as a creator, oh. you don't yet have the skills to make it there. So yeah, like, that's hard. Mm -hmm. so like, if you first start out, you're like, I'm unhappy with this. This sucks. I should stop doing this. Like, well, do you do you think that because you're being like overly self-critical and you're not giving yourself space to learn, or do you think that because you're just like, I just plain don't like writing and I would rather express myself sculpting or you know playing the guitar or something. As you're expressing yourself some way. Yeah, but it's like if you start and you're like, I'm not good at this, then you've sort of missed that. Like, I mean, and the 10,000 yeah. hours to mastery is not, it's not like a scientific principle, but like, you know, if you put 10 hours into something and you put 10,000 hours into something, like the 10,000 hour result is probably going to be way better. So you haven't even gotten to the part where you should be criticizing your own work, maybe. Well, so I think there's always that myth of talent. 
Mm. I don't think I don't think talent is a real thing. You don't think so? Uh uh. Mm. No, I mean like like you know you're drawing something and people are like oh that's really good. It's it's you know you're fortunate to be so talented. No, I'm not fortunate. I just never put down the crayon when I was five. Mm. I don't know. At, at what point do you think um, somebody can say, or it's safe to say, like, I have given like writing like this long good try, and no matter what I try, I still don't like it, and it still sucks. Like, where is where is the point where you go? Writing is not for me. When you finish college. <laughs> okay. That was a very <laughs> quick, short answer. Because I'm just like, whatever. How are you going to get anywhere in life if you can't do it till then? I don't know. Like, I think. I think that's a really hard personal decision because I mean, like, I was when I was struggling with um, with writing a novel uh, a couple years ago. I got to have dinner with Paolo Bascalupi, um, who won like every single prize you possibly could win for his first novel, The Wind Up Girl. Um, and I was like, you know, how 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 do you deal with feeling bad about what you're writing and not liking it? He's like. I finished the wind-up girl and I felt like I had failed massively. And I was like, what? Because he won every single award you could. And it was just, I don't know, it was a very eye-opening experience for me to hear him say that he felt like he had failed. Hmm. And I think it's hard to, it's, it's hard to decide. I mean, like, it sounds like you're saying you should never give up then. Well, maybe because I've tried to give up a bunch of times yeah. and just never seems to take. Yeah. <laughs> tried to quit like three times. I some determined means. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean it's just like I've never tried to quit. I've had sort of moments in my life where I've moved away from it, but I mean, you know, it, it, I think it draws you back in if you're if you're that person. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone asking that question would be like, oh, I stop, I should walk away from it. Yeah, and, yeah, just because things just be really good. If, and if you're saying that, then obviously you're vested in it and it's important to you and you actually want to continue and like maybe what you actually need is a writing group and some critical feedback and to like, you know, read some, you know, how to books and to read more great literature because I think that's really a good way to. I guess um, think, thinking about thinking about what you said about the wind-up girl, um, I think that to some degree, uh, everybody who writes, even people who write at a professional level, kind of carry forever with them this little doubt that maybe I shouldn't write at all. So I guess some some level of doubt is gonna is gonna be with you no matter how skilled you are. Maybe I don't mean that to sound nihilistic, but I just it just reminded me of this anecdote as you know uh, Neil Gaiman is married to Amanda Palmer, the musician. And she wanted to write a book, um, which is what I heard sort of being like a very ballsy person who asks for stuff and that's how she's gotten everything in her life. And so she wrote the book and then Gaiman was helping her edit it. And she tweeted something to the effect of like, this resulted in screaming arguments between the two of them with Gaiman saying, I'm really good at this, God damn it, I win awards. <laughs> so, Maybe Gaiman does not second guess himself. <laughs> okay, that guy doesn't, but many, many writers do. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. No, but saying that, I know I probably told you I do not expect you to remember. But um, because I've told them, everybody who asks me about writing, I have a learning experience. So one of the first things a library told me when she found out I had a learning Oh, writing's not for you. The day she did that, I went, I don't care if it's the worst thing I write, I am going to write a book. Now I've been working on it since high school. He's helped. And I'm sitting here when you guys are talking about looking crazy. I have to talk to the computer to write. I really look crazy. <laughs> oh, well, we all talk to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, when it's why you get pets, so you don't feel like you're talking to yourself. Well, I've, heard, I've, heard of, I've heard of other authors who use dictation software. Yeah, so. I, I've heard it more and more, and they're like, um, some of them say it actually works better because speaking it's totally different from yeah. writing it. Oh, to me, it definitely is. Yeah, and typing uses a different area of your brain from handwriting. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I mean, and 
for multiple reasons in one case. Uh, I For different reasons, and I think it's fate messing with it and using one of many words for this part. My book, I have never been able to successfully finish because it um, either the memory card breaks, uh, I almost got one. Uh, I accidentally <laughs> deleted um, stuff like that. But each time, things change. Each time. It's not the book I started with, but I'm like, when it's done, I don't really care if other people like it. I mean, I do care, but it's for me. And to me, that one person needs it. Um, now, I'm going with it. I, I am taking somebody's suggestion, which I'm having a problem with. Uh, somebody told me, take a step back, use the same world, but write it from a different person's opinion. And the amount of stuff I've gotten out of this compared to the other years, minus me losing it. So, I have gotten more information about the story set up and less than I'd say two years than I have in 15 because I've tweaked it because it's always been okay I have to put all this information in the story no, I don't. especially if this one it's like I can just do this section of it and touch on the other stuff the other story that I'll touch on because I know what I'm like because I'm writing it for me, I'm going to finish it. If it matters for the other people, that's not the point. For me, it will be finished. So, yes, I have to say, and no, she didn't do it because she thought that would start my fire. She said it because that's what she truly felt. I have a crazy thing for a librarian to say. And do you know yeah. the, the writer Patricia Polacco? She writes several oh, yeah. children's books. I saw her um, in a blizzard in Michigan one time. Um, and so she's got this book that I love. It's called Thank You, Mr. Faulkner. And it's a story about a little girl who has um, extreme, and it's not just like, it's not just numbers. It's, it's not just letters, it's numbers. And she, she's a great artist, but she, she can't, she just can't, like, they, it doesn't look like anything to her. Um, and she managed, she's so smart, she managed to fake her way to fifth grade before a teacher points out, oh, you can't really read, and then gives her the intervention she needs. And uh, Polacco puts a footnote in the book which is, it's a true story, but it actually happened when she was 14. She managed to go until she was a freshman in high school, unable to read at all before a teacher was like, you have a problem, let me help you. And now she's a writer. So it's, yeah, I mean, I can't believe a librarian would say that. It's just such a thoughtless thing to say. Well, it was a school librarian, so I don't know if she was doing it for a fashion. No. <laughs> I, I don't mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I definitely think that another thing that can that can throw you off um, on the subject of like, when is it time to give up? How do I know I can't write? Sometimes you just need a small tweak to your process, or you just need to try something like a little bit different, and that like it just changes everything and absolutely helps you going. So that's that's another reason, I guess, like why everybody should write is that like. There are so many different techniques that work for so many different people, and that maybe you just have not yet found the thing that helps you create well, or that helps your story work, or that like really like puts your process into high gear, or helps you get out that story inside of you. So like, there are, I mean, even you know, even 20 years ago, there wouldn't be dictation software, so that solution would not exist. So like, new like new possibilities. What I was doing when I first started was yeah, <laughs> yeah, but he's known me most. Of um, I <laughs> chat. I know you, Mr. Computer. I would use a recording, and I would tape it, and I would have I would have a friend of mine type it up for me. Okay. The only downside is everybody I know is very um, opinionated, mm. so sometimes they put stuff I didn't type. Oh. <laughs> I don't speak. It. And then I find it, and I go, no. <laughs> so now that I don't have to do that, I love my kids. I will stop 
It still has that, but now it's a little bit okay. I, I, a little, little less calm obvious. Down. I just need to calm down. It's just not understanding. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, no, that happened more than once. I can see that for sure. So, do we have any other comments about why people should write? Have we have we discussed this part of the issue to death? Because they're alive. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I guess that can that can take us then to the second half of the panel, which was uh, or which is ways to write and get involved in writing aside from just I'm writing a story professionally for publication where people will pay me money. So all the different ways you can get cre your creative outlet on. Um, yes. I have a, I have a, this list that I wrote up ahead of time. But do you guys want to want to start tossing out ideas? Dungeon Master. Oh, oh that's yeah. A good one. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Often often overlooked. That was not on my list. I you know if I had more time I would 100 percent be. Yeah. It's not change. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a friend who was in a three-year campaign, and she say like, oh, it really is a book, you know? And so this, and it's, it was her own gaming system in her own world, so oh, wow. it's like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's seriously pretty. Oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah, Robert, of course. Oh, Robert, Yeah, yes. she's running that yeah. campaign for years. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so, um, what else? I mean, everything. I've we talked about journaling a lot, um, and I do, and, and I don't do it as much uh, as I used to, but like dream journaling, right? So like when you wake up, and then you've already got the story, and then you write it down, right? So it's like the first thing you would do in the morning is write a story. It's so easy. I'm just, I'm, right? I'm just remembering it's so you, when you do that, and then you're awake and you reread it, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would there be demon hunters yeah. folding laundry in a hotel? And I don't even remember <laughs> writing it or having Well, that's your happen. story prompt. <laughs> then you need to figure out why. Yeah. That's real life problems. <laughs> <laughs> There's the opening scene, and go. Speaking <laughs> of prompts, I mean, there's so many things like that. So, like, when I got married, my friend gave me this. I, you might have seen it. They have it at Barnes & Noble. It's like a question a day, five-year journal. And it's got 365 pages, or oh, 360. And each one has a question, and then it's got five spaces. You know, it just says like two zero, and you fill in the year or whatever. And so, like, and you can see like how you might have changed over the space because I'm just, I'm just, I'm in the last six months of this journal. It'll be almost my five year anniversary. And yeah, it's great because like some of it will be like, like the question will be like, what's your favorite thing to do on a Sunday morning? And that like never changes. Like my answer, anything, my favorite thing to do on any given morning is be asleep. I don't like being awake in the morning. You know, but then other things like it'll be like who's you know who do you depend on right now, and like you can see like how that's changed uh, through the space of five years, and it can be very surprising. So that's a really cool one. I mean, it's kind of like weird, like and now it's starting to be like oh god, it's a burden, but I have to finish this book. So um, you know, six more months I've got on it. So that's, that's another one. Uh, what else? I mean, yeah, you could publish your own zine. I mean, just. Blogging, any kind of blogging at all. Just you start doing it, people will follow you if you do it regularly, no matter how bad you are at it, which is weird, but it, it happens. Yeah. Well, what, how much of a jerk you are. Oh, God, it's like the bigger a jerk you are, like the more <laughs> followers you'll get. That's the world we're living in now. Like, and yet, somehow, we talked about you shouldn't use your writing for evil. You shouldn't, but <laughs> people do. do. And write, right, I mean, you, you can, you can, you. Do all 140 character tweets, and suddenly you ascend to the highest level of government. So yeah, that's writing for evil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I already mentioned fan fiction. Yeah, fan fiction. Um, that's one of those like going without saying thing. Uh, how about writing and drawing web comics? Writing and drawing web comics. Yeah, that, so so this is sort of my story, which is that I was writing novels for years and years and years and years and years, and, years and nobody cared. Oh my god. And like I started. Okay, but her novel, her novel, The Hermit, is good. My, my novel, novel, The Hermit, is good, even though he found thirty-four typos in it. Uh, it's just, <laughs> that's that's a big it's book. book. It's just typos. <laughs> the Hermit by Monica Friedman. It's a good book. It's a good <laughs> desert. However, well, I wouldn't notice the typos. Right. Exactly. <laughs> However, I started drawing web comics with literally no. I mean, I think I read I read a book by Will Eisner and a book by Stan Lee. 
Um, and I started, and, oh, and I didn't know anything about drawing, I didn't know anything about Photoshop, I taught myself Photoshop, I taught myself digital, and I mean, and they're pretty abysmal in the beginning, and that was sort of like the gag of it, was that like, I suck, but I'm gonna get better. And it got to the point where like, more people have read one individual comic that I've written than have read like, all of my novels put together. I have comics that like, thousands of people have read. So yeah, that's like, yeah. And that was sort of sort of a shift I made a few years ago, where I started to sort of step back from what I wanted and kind of look at the world, and I start to feel like the graphic medium is is the future, and and getting in on it, you know, it got me this, and then that got me. Um, I did a comic with this woman, Linda Addison, who's a local writer you might have heard of, who's also very awesome, and so people are into that. People want pictures, so like you know. You see an XKCD, like if you can draw a stick figure. I think there's a webcomic where the characters are just dots, and it's one dot talking to another dot. Yeah. Um, and you get way more play on that than a, than a short story. So yeah, webcomics, great idea. <laughs> what else you got? Um, I have take a writing or poetry class. If you're, if you're very unconfident about your skills, um, you can have like formal education in that arena, like at a community college or something. I have write with your friends. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have it be a critique group. Um, That's this is something. This is something that we do all the time with some of our other friends. Is we go, let's get together with our laptops and write, and not talk to each other yeah. for two hours. Don't talk to each other. And Sounds like perfect for introverts. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can get a lot of work done that way. And if you're around other people, I think I might distract people. No, I don't. <laughs> but you wouldn't because then you start to, you feel like this, there's this sort of weight of like, I can't interrupt other people, and also I can't not do it. I'm sitting in here, everybody's typing. I must force myself. Artists peer pressure for good. <laughs> yeah, but even I can't read what I type. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, maybe if you use dictation software, you could do like a virtual version of that. Like you could find some kind of chat app or something yeah, with people. Like that, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, like Slack or something. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Um, I've done that also with some people before, and even if we're not in the same room, you know, I would like type, "I'm here writing," and I don't yeah, know. and then yeah, and then and then like, oh my gosh, I should be writing. <laughs> <laughs> what I tend to do is okay. I'm part of a wow group. Okay. And they get on this. A lot of times, I have them approach the job. And they know I'm doing that stuff. Because occasionally they go, well, how much of this is going to end up in Rachel's book? I'm just sitting there in the background, I'm just listening to that. And I'm doing my book. Which sometimes I don't But anyhow, they go, Rachel, you're not in your thing. You're talking to us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly a way to get it's certainly a way to get people involved in writing, although whether they want to or not, I don't, I don't know about that. Unwilling participants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 you're right. The only time that they, they, they sometimes are like Rachel, Ray, quit that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have. Uh, we haven't talked about this, but we can touch on it. No pun intended. Writing erotica. Oh, yeah. I think it's a great it's a great way to get involved in writing because there's there's like such a market for that. I mean, there's a huge market for romance novels. I I actually find it really funny, especially when it's the tea, you know, you tease and then go off to something else. Because it gets their attention and then you go to something else. Yeah, and you should go to that romance panel that Ed is doing. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. Yeah, the, I, it's, it's either tomorrow or Sunday. There's building romance when when uh, bullets fire and oh, yeah, bullets yeah, fly yeah. and lasers fire. I have to say, oh, that was, that's what that's about. I did not get that in the, when I was reading the panel. I did not oh. think that with what they were talking about. Oh, I figured it was some sort of game. It is, but the greatest game. That's another. <laughs> I, I had a period of my life where I was writing quite a lot of, and I wouldn't even call it erotic, it was probably pornography, but <laughs> people were like, oh my god, this is the best written pornography I've ever seen, and I immediately had like 300 live journal followers, which was back when this was happening, was when I had 300, you know, like overnight, uh, you know, so yeah, people like to read dirty stories. Graphic novels are, you know, the female, and there are not guys that even 
So I would tell you something, another funny thing. So so I have a I have a friend who writes what she refers to as down market fiction, which in her case um, is exclusively queer romance, which is hilarious because she's a heterosexual woman. And she <laughs> writes only gay male uh, romance novels. Um, and she, under a pen name even, uh, and she put them in the Kindle store and she has a regular income from this. Wow. Like she makes a couple hundred bucks a month from like having like one novel and nine short stories because people like it. And the other thing about it is that people, this is what she found in her research, people will pay money to put that stuff on their Kindle because they are embarrassed to have it in a print book. <laughs> no one can tell what you're reading on your Kindle. That's good marketing. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's good marketing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, because I don't mind searching around looking around and scrolling really because it's that really bad. <laughs> uh, all my characters. characters. Yeah. I, I did. I um, would write up the characters, the basics. Mm-hmm. Rigid sexuality. Um, I wrote that one. I think it's a way to not have everything be the same. Yeah, it, it, yeah. And sometimes you get people that are really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, well, um, in, that was one of the things because I was like, okay. I remember when I first started the book, I was very picky on this person has to be this, this person has to be that, and that. And I'm not saying like they're actually you know, alive, but I think my characters didn't like that. If that makes sense. It was too random and that they wanted to be they wanted to be who they yeah. were. Yeah, they so uh, like so when I read them, I'm like, okay. And there are times that I redid it because sometimes people in the show will know too much of one thing. Um, but I would take a die 20 for free labels. Um, and for sexuality, I flip a coin. A couple of times I've had things left on the side, uh, <laughs> which is fun. Um, but it, it, I, I realized it changed the aspect of the story, but it made it interesting. And I just wonder how do other people do that? How do other people pick? Like make a determination on yeah. how much sexuality or how much eroticism you put into a story, or how to yeah, character sexual. Oh, I think I mean for a lot of people, I think your character starts to become real, and then you'll know. Like they'll tell you like, well, I'm mostly straight, but that girl is beautiful, or I feel asexual, you know, and, and you'll just see it as they move through the story if, if they feel real to you. Um, I guess so. My, my experience is a little bit different because I write short fiction, mm-hmm. and in a lot of the stories I write, the characters aren't real enough to have that dimension of them explored, mm-hmm. or I never learned about them, or it doesn't matter to the story because it's not, it's not like a novel where you really kind of get in depth into what's inside people. In some cases, it matters. Or like, it's like it's like 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 Luke Smith in love. Yes. Story. Like yes. That's, so, the romance is the aspect. Yes, so I like I have a like I have a story in my forthcoming collection, which is a, a romance story, and, and it involves like a man falling in love with a woman. So like those sexualities are in there because it's part of the story and it makes it work. Um, and in another story in my collection, um, I have uh, I have two men who are in love like very late in life, and that is the fact that they're in love is important to the plot, but. I could have easily made one of them a woman, but that was just something I felt like putting in. I mean, sometimes sometimes it's something that I pick on purpose, sometimes it's something that never comes up. Sometimes I have decided it randomly to be like, oh, I haven't like written a lot of lesbian characters, like, I should like try writing that to see how it is. Um, so I think it really depends. I think we have answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking about that uh, that Ed Hunard story I was talking about earlier. Okay. It's, it's a science fiction romance, and it's a love triangle, but you know from the beginning which two characters are going to get together, and the third character, is ext- she's a woman, she's a battle princess, and she's extremely sexually aggressive with the male character, 
um, and just keeps trying and keeps trying and keeps rebuffing her. Um, and then about halfway through the story, the third character has this moderate psionic ability where when she touches you, she knows your greatest desire, your greatest fear, um, and she touches this woman and realizes the woman's actually a deep, deeply closeted lesbian. So like that's a plot twist, right? Like there's a point to that of like why that's happening. So I mean, I think when Ed wrote that story, he was like, oh, I have to have this woman and she's actually not gonna get the guy and here are these reasons she's not gonna get the guy. Yeah. I think, well, I think ex like experimenting in romance fiction or in erotic fiction or in any, any work that has a romantic or erotic subtext gives you a lot more freedom to try kind of those different, those different things. Um, which uh, circles circles back to the, to what I was talking about like five or ten minutes ago, which is like people are like people are very interested in erotica and romance, and even if you uh, try to write a character that you wouldn't normally write, um, you're going to find somebody who's curious and wants to read about that. Uh, if you write from a sexuality that you know very well, people are going to be excited by that and want to read that. So you'll get I think you'll get a lot of reader engagement whenever you try. People like no, sex. I find it really yes, people like sex, in short. <laughs> <laughs> I find it really interesting that actually, because of her, my main, main character, I've discovered who I thought would be main characters. Some of them have moved back. Oh, yeah. Right? Some of them, have, yeah. and those who I never thought would have walked forward, and I'm like, wait, when that happened? <laughs> it's told, we were just talking about that earlier. Like, I am the master of writing thousands of words and then realizing I've told the story from the wrong perspective. And, you know, having to go back and, like, change which character is the main character. And that's totally normal. So, yeah, I mean, I think in your case, it sounds like when you find the characters that, like, are speaking to you, and then they're there. And then you'll, you'll know they're there. And they'll the show. So, I have, I've had characters that I thought would be a footnote. Mentioned, but and suddenly they're really important. And then suddenly they're really important, and I didn't necessarily expect that. Which I like, because oh, yeah. it yeah. means I'm, I this journey is not just for the reader. This is my journey too. So it's pretty like going with the dream thought. What uh, the night that I was starting to consider when people were saying you should come up with a side. Sorry, I was thinking about that when I went to sleep. One thing, I don't normally remember my dreams, but I remembered one thing. And I remember a red haired boy, well, strawberry blonde, um, and he said one thing. He goes, I may be a son of man, but I was raised by the day. And that was enough for me to go, okay, how am I going to? Inspiration can come from a lot of places where you might not expect it, and yeah. sometimes you just have to roll with it. Yes, that's true. Well, I'm trying not to tell a lot, so, because I'm really bad at that. <laughs> My first novel actually came from a dream, and it's not, yeah, yeah, and it's not as if the dream and the novel have anything whatsoever in common, but I had a dream about a man and a girl fighting a witch, and the man and the girl became the characters in the story. Mm -hmm. I guess that's I guess that's another reason everyone should write is because something in our subconscious compels us, and it can come out in dreams yeah. or other vivid yeah. images. That's true. What else is on your list? Oh yes, ways ways to involve writing. Uh, right handwritten or uh, typed. Okay, we're almost up. Oh we are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh okay. Appreciate. Let's go. Oh man, I have like ten minutes on here. Okay. Uh, wait, wait. Okay, we did that one. Power through. Post your writing online somewhere for free, or create free ebooks for your friends or family, or just for you. Um, sit somewhere in public and describe everything you see and everything that's happening as an exercise in character. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. It really passes the time at airports. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, write emails to friends where you tell a funny story about something that happened over your day, or just write emails to friends. Uh, for many years, um, Monica and I would write emails to each other every night to say, this is what happens today. And sometimes there would be funny stories in there. Um, and then we moved to the same city and now we didn't talk. We <laughs> didn't talk, we just do it with our face holes. Yeah. And not like, you know, over email. <laughs> face holes. 
Uh, write handwritten or typed or printed letters or postcards. Some people love getting yes, printed. Yeah, I love sending letters. Oh yeah, face hole. And everyone loves receiving letters, and it's such a lost art. Even postcards and handmade cards. Yeah, people love getting them. Uh, like a wax seal and everything. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, write stories or poetry just for yourself. Sometimes if you have a very powerful story or poem inside of you that you don't feel comfortable sharing, it can still feel good to put it out on paper. Um, you know, as part of the knowing yourself kind of thing we were talking about earlier. Uh, write a collection of stories or poems for a best friend or partner. Um, for my husband, I took a blank journal and I put love poems and illustrations in it and I gave it to him as a gift. And he's probably going to be the only person who ever sees that thing. Um, but still, meaningful and good to do. Um, we talked about prompts. Uh, there's, there's a game that I used to play in high school or middle school, Add to the Story, where you write a paragraph or a couple lines and you pass it to a friend and then they yeah, continue to write it. We also did it as an oral game when I was a little kid, my sister and brother. Oh, yeah, a storytelling game. Yeah, Somebody yeah. talks and then you, you pass an object to so like the next person in the circle and they have to like tell part of the story. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning of the panel, eulogies or wedding toasts. Uh, there are a few times in life where, we, where it's culturally okay for us to stand up and tell a room full of people, this is what this person needs to be and this is how special they are. Um, those are often very overlooked opportunities uh, that I think people should take advantage of. Even if you're too shy to deliver to deliver the thing in person. Um, you can send it afterwards and the target of the toast can be very appreciative. I recently attended a wedding where I wanted to say a few words, but the wedding planner had everything iron locked down on schedule and there was no space for my two minute speech. So I mailed it afterwards to my friends who were getting married and they wrote back about how thankful they, they were and how very much they liked it. And maybe it'll go in a scrapbook someday, I don't know. Um, and lastly, I have RP or role playing. Um, which can be for fun, sexy times, or just for writing a story with someone, you know, where you both sit on the other side of the computer and go like, I'm going to pretend to be this character, and if I was Batman, like, I would totally, like, go down the street and then punch that asshole in the face. <laughs> and the person's like, well, I'm going to pretend to be that asshole, and if you punched me, this is what I would do. And it's, um, it's kind of like... It's the horrors of D&D is so fun. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, like... Um, you know, whether you do it as a tabletop role-playing game or just as not even with any game mechanics or a storytelling element over I am with your friends, um, it does count as writing. Uh, so that is everything on my list. I think we are technically we are over time, over time. Yeah, but there's so. hardly hordes beating down the door, so I think we're okay. Indeed. So thank you all for coming to our panel. Uh, I hope you got something out of it. And uh, hey, enjoy Comic-Con. <laughs> Thank you for listening to D&D Journey of the 5th Edition, a member of the Creative Play and Podcast Network. And remember, be careful out there, there be dragons about. <laughs> <laughs>